So we're going to talk about pacemaker cells. And these are actually really, really cool cells because these are the cells in our heart that basically keep all of the heart beating both in a certain rhythm and at a certain pace, right? So these cells are going to work from the moment that you're conceived in a little fetus in, in, uh, in the womb all the way to the point where you die. So these pacemaker cells have a property, and we call that property automaticity. Automaticity actually has the word automatic right in it, right? So automatic. And all that means is that you don't actually need a neighboring cell to tell this guy that he needs to fire an action potential. Pacemaker cells can do it themselves. It's actually a pretty, pretty neat thing. And when you think about it, these are the cells where everything really begins in. So there's three clumps of pacemaker cells, or three groups that we talk about. One would be the group of cells sitting in what we call the sinoatrial node, SA node. And this is probably the most common group that we think of. But there's also some pacemaker cells in the atrioventricular node, or AV node. So this is another group of potential pacemaker cells. And finally, there's a third group in what we call the bundle of Hiss and Purkinje fibers. Now, I know this sounds like I'm speaking a new language because I'm throwing out a lot of words uh, that really uh, may not make a lot of sense. But all that you need to know about these three are that they are just in different parts of the electrical conduction system of the heart. So they're all parts of the electrical conduction system. And they're just at different locations in the heart. So they make a part of the electrical conduction system, and they're all kind of given this special property of having the ability to, to pace the heart. Let me make a little bit of space now. To really understand these three groups of cells and what you know, the kind of magic they can actually uh, bestow upon us, let's, let's talk in terms of how heart cells really talk and think. And, and they don't really think uh, kind of the way you and I might think. They think in terms of voltage. This is, this is kind of their language. And so to understand them, let's, let's use it. So this is millivolts. And let's say this is positive, and let's say this is negative, because that's probably most intuitive. We have uh, a few ions that are going to pass into and out of cells. And you know that ions are going to help determine the voltage of a cell. And we've, we've talked about that uh, in other videos. And so let's say this is calcium right here. This is calcium. So why am I drawing an arrow with a voltage up there? 123. What that means is that if calcium was the only ion moving into and out of a cell, then the cell's voltage would be 123. So it really just tells you what would happen if that was the only ion that had uh, the ability to permeate a cell. Now, let's say sodium was the only ion able to permeate a cell, go into and out of a cell, then the memory potential would be 67. So it would actually be almost a, a little bit more than half. And then finally, if let's say potassium was the only ion that could get into and out of a cell, this potassium down here, then the memory potential would be negative 92. So potassium likes things to be more negative. Now, in real life, we have cells, uh, and I'll draw a cell right here, that actually are permeable to multiple things, right? They're not just permeable to one ion. And let's say, for argument's sake, that, you know, it's half permeable to uh, calcium and half permeable to sodium. Well, if it's exactly half and half, then your membrane potential will be somewhere in the middle, somewhere like there. And that works out to about, uh, what is that? Let's see if I can do my math quickly. 97 or so. So around 97, maybe 96. So that'd be about 96 millivolts, because it would be half and half, so it'd be split between the two. Now, let's say that it was only permeable to, well, let's say 99% permeable to potassium and 1% permeable to sodium. Well, then it would be down here, very, very close to potassium. It'd probably be like 90, 90, negative 91. So depending on how permeable it is to what ion, you can kind of predict roughly what the memory potential is going to be. Now, let's start out. Let's say that our cell here is going to be one of these pacemaker cells, and it's permeable to just salt. Actually, you know what? Before I do that, let me tell you what its voltage is. Let's say its voltage is negative 60. I won't tell you how we got there. We'll figure that out later. But it's negative 60. And I tell you that it's permeable to just salt, or maybe not just salt, but predominantly salt. And we know salt is going to want to rush into the cell because there's a lot more salt on the outside than on the inside. Now, if that was the case, if it was at negative 60 and never, and put aside the thought of how to get there in the first place, but let's say it was there, what would happen if it was permeable to, to primarily salt? Well, it's going to want to eventually get up here, right? It might take some time, which is why I drew, drew it all the way out there. And remember, this is our time access. It might take some time to get there, but it will eventually want to get there, right? It'll eventually want to get over to close to positive 67 if sodium is the major ion that it's permeable to. So it's going to start in that direction. Actually, that's about exactly what happens. It starts kind of marching towards that point. Now, it gets a little bit further along uh, and, uh, from negative 60, so it's like, let's say, negative 40. And then an interesting thing happens. It doesn't just continue to that purple dot. Let me erase that purple dot now. It doesn't continue there, but it actually hits a threshold. Now, when I say threshold, you'll see in just a few moments what I mean, but it hits this threshold, and this threshold is for a new type of ion. So let me actually switch it up. I'm going to actually uh, save myself some time by just cutting and pasting this like that. I'm going to move it over here. So this is my cell, right? And now we got to negative 40, and a new channel emerges. So we have this channel here for calcium. And we have a bunch of them. So calcium starts dumping into the cell. And calcium, just like sodium, loves to be inside of the cell. So now you've got a lot of calcium. And what opened up these channels? These are actually voltage-gated channels. That's actually why I said that there was a threshold. Because these channels, I didn't actually draw them before. They're there. It's not like it's not as if the cell just made these channels out of thin air. They were there the whole time. But they were closed. They were closed, literally gated shut. And so now that you hit negative 40, that's their ticket. Now they open up and they let all the calcium in. So that's why we call it voltage-gated. And that's why we say that there's a threshold. This is the word threshold. It really is talking about what is the voltage needed to open those calcium gates. So now calcium pours in. So now you can kind of step back and think about what will happen to our white line. If calcium is the major ion that this cell is permeable to now, I mean, it's still a little bit permeable to salt, you can see that, but mostly calcium, it's going to want to rise up to calcium's resting potential, which is even higher than sodium's. So instead of going kind of chugging along slowly, it's going to start moving up in a nice kind of steady clip. Now it's going to go up nice and quick, right? So it's going to start getting more steep. So it was going slowly, now it's going more steep. And it gets to, let's say, positive 10. And now the next interesting thing happens. So we said that these calcium channels are voltage gated, and that's what makes them open. Well, the cool thing is that that's not only what makes them open, it's also what makes them shut. And so let me actually draw this one more time. I'll just cut and paste it, and now I'll put it over here. And if that's what makes them shut, then watch, watch what happens now. I'm going to actually erase this calcium because now these voltage-gated channels are going to close down and we're going to have to show them close. So let's draw a little X's here so no more calcium can get in. So you've got just that sodium. And at the same moment that the calcium-gated channels close, that same moment, the potassium voltage-gated channels open. So now you have some potassium channels here that open up. And the potassium is going to escape, right? It's going to leave because potassium loves to leave the cell. It likes to get outside because that's the direction of its concentration gradient. And so just like we said that the calcium has voltage-gated, so does the potassium. So these are voltage-gated as well. And they're voltage-gated to open when it's a little bit more positive. 
And just like I said, you know, earlier that these voltage gated channels exist, they certainly exist. I just didn't draw them, but they're closed. So they were closed up until this point. They were there the whole time. So they were there in both scenarios, right? They were there and they just stayed shut. So if the potassium is escaping, what happens to our white line? Think about that. Well, it's going to go towards now that potassium is the dominant ion. Always think in terms of what's the dominant ion in terms of permeability. Our cell is mostly permeable to potassium right now. So the memory potential is going to go towards potassium. And potassium is way down here. So it's going to start going down. So the memory potential starts creeping down, creeping down, creeping down, and stops. Stops right here, negative 60. Well, why did it stop? Why didn't it just go all the way down closer to negative 92? Well, just as the calcium ion, uh, calcium gated channels shut, so do the potassium. So these ones actually shut down as well. And I'm just going to erase this potassium at this point because now they're shut. And I'm even going to put a little access through them. So basically, these are not open for business, closed for business. So now we have just the sodium entering. Well, this looks a lot like how we started, right? And so what happens is that this process repeats itself. So it basically will just rise up until threshold. The calcium gated channels flip up and open. Then they close and the potassium gated channels open and they close and we're back to the sodium. So this is how we get our uh, action potential. This is how it forms. And you can see that I didn't talk about any other cells. This is a cell doing it all by itself. And because the channels are constantly opening and closing, we don't really ever think of this cell as having a resting potential. It's just, it has a membrane potential, but it's never really resting anywhere. It's always kind of on the move, right? It's always either rising or falling. So now if my heart rate, let's say my heart rate is 60 beats a minute, right? 60 beats per minute. Then what that means is that this right here, this is one heartbeat, one heartbeat is happening in one second, right? Which I think is pretty sweet. I mean, all this stuff is happening in one second. The sodium's coming in and the calcium's coming in and then that stops, but then the potassium rushes out and then that stops and then the whole thing happens again and again and again every single second. So this is how our heart is beating. This, this little cycle keeps going on and on and on. And now people will actually talk about different phases of this. There, there are obviously three basic phases, right? That I've drawn up for us. So there's this phase four. This is called phase zero and this is phase three. Now you're thinking, wait a second, this sounds totally wacky. Why would you call it phase four, zero, three? What, what sense does that make? And I'll draw for you an example of how the heart muscle, actually, the action potentials in the heart muscle look. And you'll see how this naming system came about. I'm not trying to defend it because I don't think it's the best, but this is at least how it came about. So when heart muscle beats, it looks like that. It doesn't look the way that we've drawn this one. And I'll uh, get into that one some other uh, time. But that's what it looks like. And if you were to number the different parts, the numbers would be basically uh, this down here is phase four, and this up here is phase, or this is phase zero, and then there's phase one, two, and then three. And so someone kind of stepped back and took a look at this and said, well, this phase four looks a lot like this guy, and this phase zero, this upward swing looks like this upward swing, and then this downward swing looks like this. So that's how the phase four, zero, and three come about. And they said, well, I guess these pacemaker cells, they don't have phase one and two. So let's just ignore those two numbers. So that's why those two numbers are not included when I number four, zero, and three. But, uh, but there is something actually kind of uh, important I want to point out uh, when comparing the phase zero here. So in the pacemaker cell, the phase zero right here, it might seem pretty fast you know, to, to you and I. It happens, you know, let's say, uh, about in a tenth of a second or in about uh, two tenths of a second. But in fact, it's actually a little bit slower. It's, uh, let me write it right here. It's actually a little bit slower than what happens with the heart muscle. This one is actually faster. I'm talking specifically about phase zero. So because it's slower, and that phase zero is called the action potential, this is a slower action potential. And the other one is considered a fast action potential. So sometimes you might hear that term, uh, the slow action potential cells or something like that. And they're, they're referring to the pacemaker cells when they say that. The last thing I should probably mention is that anytime you go up like this and you actually become less negative, that's called depolarization. I want to make sure that's really, really clear. So anytime you become less negative, that's considered depolarization. And anytime you become more negative like that, that's considered repolarization, repolarization. So in this case, we have phase four and zero are kind of slowly depolarizing. And then phase three is repolarizing ourselves.